Hi everybody, um, much like yesterday, I'm Steph Vincent. Um, I just want to say thank you for bearing with me this morning after my technical hitch. But as you can see from the title of my talk, it absolutely will be worth it because we're going to be discussing uh, fees for the transfer of archaeological archives in museums in England. Um, so this is a Historic England commissioned piece of work. Now, I don't know if anybody knows this, but we do have a problem in terms of archaeological storage in museums. Um, it turns out everybody's either full or getting full, and yet archives keep coming. So there's been a lot of work done um, to try and look at how we deal with this project. Now, what I'm going to tell you is not the answer to, to that problem. Um, but it does feed into those discussions that we're having. So you'll be aware of the SMA work that's been going on over the last few years. There's been other pieces of work by Historic England that's been done. And in the Southwest, we had a regional project called Seeing the Light of Deer, which was looking at different aspects of, of this storage problem. Um, and what I am trying to do is... Um, fulfill this aspect of the Mendoza report, which came out last year and which tasks Historic England to work with key stakeholders to produce recommendations for the DCMS, which will improve the long-term sustainability of the archaeological archives generated by developer-funded excavations. Now, one thing that these other projects have um, all run into, a little stumbling block that we've run into, is that when you are trying to compare other options for archaeological storage that aren't traditionally within your museum stores, one of the things you want to look at is how much money is available, how much money people are getting in from using their archives, what they're using that money for. And that's always been a little bit of a, an unknown quantity. And so that's what um, this piece of work very specifically sets out to look at. So um, there were quite, uh, quite a specific remit. So first of all, what are we charging for the deposition of archaeological archives? Um, what costs are we looking for those charges to offset? How are we calculating those costs? Um, are there any stumbling blocks for us as organisations um, to work those costs out? And how then is the money that's coming in from the deposition of archives being used within organisations? Um, just to point out, I will just keep referring to museums when I'm talking, but actually to participate in the project, you just needed to meet these three criteria. So I will keep saying museums because it's easier, but uh, this, there were um, um, archive departments who also participated in the study. So we did try and make it as broad as possible. Um, so uh, basically what we first set out to do was to um, answer this question. <laughs> what do organisations charge for the deposition of archaeological archives? So I sent out a very short survey to everybody and their mother to try and get them to respond and just give me that information. So people were providing their deposition guidelines where that information wasn't published online or they didn't have a document, they were just sort of telling me what they were doing. Um, and a combination of people responding to that and then me going out and collecting additional information. Um, I had 63 people respond to um, that survey. Every one of them was charging for commercially produced, so developer-led produced um, archives. People do also hypothetically charge for other types of archives, so community archive and academically created archives, but everybody indicated that they would work with those type of groups, so we didn't consider that too much. Um, what I really should do is just more or less answer this question by doing this. Oh, I could have said anything here and it would have been correct because some museums would have been charging that. Um, I tried to break it up a little bit though. So we have um, 
a group of museums who charge a minimum fee for archive. Um, that minimum fee ranges between anything from £45 to £395. And the way that works with the minimum fee is uh, you pay that and you get X amount of boxes included. So that can be anything from two to six boxes, not always correlating with the amount that the minimum fee is. So just because you're charging a higher minimum fee doesn't mean that they automatically get more boxes included in that minimum fee, which is handy. Um, and there are also a small group of um, organisations who are charging a fee prior to deposition. So at the point of notification to the museum, they're charging either a pure administration fee or they're asking for all or part of their minimum deposition money up front. And the rationale behind that when talking to people is essentially that this is the part that takes staff quite a long time, corresponding with the depositors and getting this into your system. A lot of people issue accession numbers at this point or some kind of temporary numbering system. And we know that from notification to actual deposition can take forever. So you could be actually spending quite a lot of your time providing a service, which then your organisation is not going to be paid for until several years down the line. And so that was what this group of people kind of were thinking through that rationale. And um, overall as well, we divide into two groups. There's um, those of us, the majority, who um, charge one fee per unit within an archive. So they will charge you the same whether you um, give them a tiny box of small finds or a big box of pottery. Um, it doesn't matter. They are dealing still with getting that one thing, putting it into their systems, putting it on their shelves. So the, the amount of time spent servicing that one box, if you will, I don't think I should have explained it like that, but let's go with it. Um, it will be the same regardless of what actually is in it. But you can see that, again, the variation in what people are charging is massive. Um, the 17... Where's my little thing is? The 1723 uh, correlates to the uh, Historic England box grant charge, box grant recommended level... We'll come to that again later on. <laughs> um, and then there are the other group of museums who are charging, who charge a different amount depending on what is in your archive. Um, so this often goes by size of box, purely by size of box, but other some places do differentiate between bulk finds and small finds, iron material versus other type of small type fine material um, and you know there's one there's one organization where there's a list of it's two sides of a4 the different charges because a box 10 millimeters or 20 millimeters bigger will be a different cost to deposit with them um, and it, but again <laughs> it's a bit how long is a piece of string those don't necessarily correlate between these organizations so it's not like a large bulk finds box is costing the same at all of these organizations and interestingly, there's no correlation between, it's not if you're depositing with a larger organisation or a local authority organisation, then you are automatically going to be charged more. If that doesn't, that's not how it works. It just is what it is, what it is. Um, that being said, and I have to say that I did expect it to be somewhat confusing, that information that was coming out. Um, just based on my own knowledge of, of how we all work. Um, but what we wanted to do, once that was kind of um, quantified and really confirmed to us, what we wanted to do <coughs> is talk to people about why this was happening. Because to get this many different ideas about what we should be charging for things, people were obviously coming at it in, in different ways. And that's what we wanted to um, try and find out. So in my first survey, I asked people to volunteer to um, take part in a lovely phone chat with me um, where we could try and flesh out some of these, these issues. Um, and I would really like to thank everybody who participated in that because it was really, really helpful. We got some really good information um, 
and I got to be really nosy about where everybody works, which I love, so that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the questions we asked in phase two was, what's your organisation's motivation behind charging for your archives? What are you trying to do? And people could answer yes to more than one of these questions. Um, but the main reason, as you can see, was to offset some of the costs of collecting these archives. And there were kind of two main strands why people identified that as important. The first being that there's an understanding that the, the creation of these archives is a professional process. And it's a process by which other parts of that the line get paid. So, you know, your planning archaeologists, there's, there's nobody saying they shouldn't be paid for their services. There's nobody denying that we should be paying the commercial archaeologists for their services. We are providing a service which forms part of that chain and people felt that our skills should be recognised within that. But also um, the fact that this... Oh, oh. well, that's... Oh, close your eyes a minute, otherwise we'll get all the previews. Um, uh, the recognition that um, this is a a different collection to other things we collect. If you're collecting decorative art, you have a lot of say over what you do and do not take into your museum collections. And that is not, that's not the case with archaeology. If you're open and if it's within your area, then you take it. I mean, you may in certain circumstances try and talk about rationalisation or about a sampling selection, but really, it is a very, for the museum, it's a very passive process. And so therefore, it was felt that to justify the continuation of this process, um, you, ha you had to be covering at least part of your costs. You couldn't just continue to do this without really having control over what it was that you were, you were taking in. And then also, interestingly, there was a group of people um, here who identified quality control as their their main reason for instituting charges and everybody in this group I think it was five people yeah five people um actually said that they weren't planning on really covering costs that's absolutely not what it was about but they'd seen a massive change in the condition of archives coming into their museum the quality to which they were prepared and the amount more thought had clearly gone into it. So there was one organisation that was telling me they'd gone from just having boxes of unstratified, you know, not archivally uh, important material just dumped willy-nilly on them to them then getting actually considered usable, properly prepared archives. And so the combination between them charging a fee and also staff members not having to spend time and resource fixing the archives as they were coming in was making a real difference to them. We then asked people how, um, how they'd actually come up with what they were charging. And um, this was really interesting. So um, this group here, so it tended to be the organisations that charge based on what they felt their own costs were, used a combination of what they think their storage costs <coughs> are and what they think their staff costs are. But actually, once you started to drill down into that, the phrase <laughs> approximately, you know, about that, that seemed reasonable. Those type of phrases started coming up time and time again. And actually, there's only one organisation that has really, really bottomed out all of this information. What you'll find is that some people know what their rent is for an off-site store, say, but they don't pay for any of their electricity or whatever, because if they're part of a large, larger organisation, that's just paid out for different budgets. So they, they don't know, they, it would take them forever to try and find that out. Um, the same with all sorts of other running costs like maintenance, I don't know, making sure that your fire extinguishers work every year, getting pat testing, things like that. They're just not really included. And what people said was the notion that they could go away and find that information out was just not real to life. There, there was no way that they could spend the amount of time needed to find out all of that nuanced information. Um, 
The largest group, as you can see, said that they benchmarked against other museums. Um, it's really fast to do, it's really easy to do. You're not doing anything controversial. You can point and say, we're just in line with all these other people. But once you start talking to people, it becomes clear that we are all benchmarking against a very similar <laughs> group of museums and that we don't necessarily understand how those museums came up with their fees in the first place. And the, the, the wanting to keep everything kind of on the same level leads to everything being on the same level without a lot of um, reference to whether that's actually the level that we need. Um, and then there's this here, <laughs> the Historic England Fox Grant amount. So um, this goes up with inflation year on year. There were seven people who said that their fees were the HE Fox Grant amount. However, when I looked at those fees, only three of them were actually charging the HE Box Grant amount. The rest were charging something that then bears no resemblance <laughs> to the HE Box Grant <laughs> amount now, in the past, in the future, as far as I can tell. Um, and so once I explained that to them, they were then at a, a bit of a loss to understand how that had come about. What I will say is that this is a confusing Thing, and I'll talk about it a little bit more at the end, but just bear that in mind, we're going to come back to that. Um, we asked, asked if there were factors outside just understanding their own needs that impacted people setting their fees. I was actually expecting a lot of people to say that they were under a massive amount of pressure from their local authority, trustees, <coughs> whoever it may be, to bring in a lot of money. And actually, that's not what people said. In some places, yes, there are pressures to either make a certain amount of money or certainly contribute towards an income target for your museum or heritage service. But actually, as many people reported that they, were, they got pressured to keep their fees low from these same sorts of committees as were reporting they were getting pushed to push them higher. Um, there's a, a real sort of want to be seen to be doing what other people are doing because surely somebody's worked this out so if we are doing the same as other people then we'll be doing it right that kind of refrain really came out quite a lot and um, as did uh the idea that they didn't want to push it too much because then depositors just wouldn't send them the stuff when you really dig down into that it's difficult because Actually, nobody was specifically reporting that a company had just said, oh, that's too much. But I think we all know within our own areas that there are companies which are much more and much less likely to engage <laughs> in, in with us. And if people aren't engaging, it's difficult to get them to engage then if you're going to put a fee on. So it's, it's this notion, it, it's, it's a little bit more of potentially a Fear than people actually reporting that this has happened. Um, but it is a real worry and it is affecting how people are, are thinking about their fees, definitely. And then we also asked if the income from the fees was ring fenced. You can see that for quite a lot of organisations it was. It came into an income code and it was spent from that income code on a specific range of activities. The 50% of people who said no. That's a combination, really, of people who um, just don't know because they're, they're in their museum and their finance department is somewhere else and they just don't really know. And potentially the income's actually sort of set towards an income target. So as long as their organisation makes that target, everything's rosy. So it's sort of ring fence. Um, and the rest just said, no... Because honestly, we don't, we don't hardly get any money in. It would cost us more to ring fence the money in terms of setting up a budget code of getting our finance people to understand what this is and why we need it to go to that place. That would cost more probably than we would charge in a year anyway. So, you know, what's the point? Um, so that brings us on to the next sort of headline. And I did talk to people about a, a lot of different issues. So this is quite a quick fly through. 
Um, <coughs> so I asked people if they could tell us what their actual annual income was from archaeological archives. And as you can see, most people said no. 58% of people just literally said no. Mm -mm, no, can't do that, won't do that. <laughs> um, a few people knew that they'd made nothing. <laughs> At this higher end of the scale here, oddly, these people knew how much they'd made, usually because it was a really exceptionally odd year in which they'd made this much money. They'd had a single massive archive that had come in and so they knew that off the top of their head that that was a really that was an outlier and um, but most people just had no real clue and so what we I asked people to do then was if they could go away and if they could provide me instead of sort of a general idea of what they were getting could they give me <laughs> the details for a financial year and 11 of the 36 museums came back and said they could give me details for the 2017-18 financial year. And the total of income from those 11 museums was £63,418.50 in total, which I is not a great deal of money, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um, and that brings me to uh, some of the, the things in which I think we should maybe start talking about <laughs> with, the, with the fees. So, and it almost sort of goes without saying, but I feel like we also can't say it enough. Anything to do with fees and anything to do with taking archives into our museums is just driven by our desire to safeguard our archaeological collections. And it's something that every single person mentioned to me at some point during my conversation with them, that they wanted to be upfront, that actually all of this was secondary and what they didn't want to do was to do anything <laughs> which might jeopardise this, this um, material coming to somewhere where they felt it would be appropriate for it to be held. <sighs> the Historic England box grant. So this really confuses people. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, apology was to Duncan. <laughs> Sorry. Um, a lot of people think it's the rate that Historic England or English Heritage have recommended that we charge to take boxes into our archives. And therefore, <coughs> it is based on fact, because obviously Historic England is a very professional organisation and wouldn't just tell us something for the sake of telling us something. So um, it's very solidly based on fact, and so that's what they think they should be charging. If well, even where people know that that's not the case, that this was a very specific kind of recommendation for Historic England um, to give money to organisations specifically taking Historic England archives, the impression that this is based on calculations about the cost of storage still remains. So where people are working out their costs and realising that they're much greater than this uh, box grant level, they're then saying, oh, but it's, a, it's really different to that. So maybe we won't put it up as much as I've calculated we should. Maybe if we just do it half of what I think, because then it's not as bad um, as you know, as really whacking it right up. So there is something just about this number being out there that has caused people to to reflect on deviating too much from it, too much from the norm, I suppose, um, which is just something to think about. Really, the main reason that um, the fees were so different is that nobody is covering the same costs at all. So the, this leads into the other point here that we can understand our storage costs. In many organisations that is next to impossible. If you are, and I'll use my organisation as an example, um, I have my organisation, my stores within a local authority, the buildings owned by the council so we don't really pay rent there, a different department pays our um, utilities, 
Maintenance is centrally funded. We have to pay for transport to and fro. Things like that. It's inc- it's an incredibly dense set of calculations, and it also assumes that what we should be charging for is a cubic meter of storage. And I do wonder whether that's that's quite right, and whether actually that's something that we can base a fee system on because it is very intangible it's very unknowable i think the last thing just to point out is that we have with these other projects that i mentioned at the beginning people have been discussing more and more the potential for regional store set up partnership working national storage or the use of deep store off other off-site storage um, facilities i think what we just need to have a very big um, verified awareness of is that even if the funding to set up those type of stores was provided externally, the income that that museums then get from people depositing could not be relied on to make those um, self-sufficient. Because you could never tell what was coming in year on year. And even if you could, it was likely if we are kind of still within the same fee structure as we have now, those amounts will be incredibly low. Um, and that's it really it's just some things to think about to open up maybe the little bit of discussion and to hand on to historic england to do with what they will so i've just finished by just re-thanking everybody who took part in the project because it was really really (coughs) useful to have everybody's input thank you